Who were they? The first one, I forget the name. The second one, never knew his name. The third was Stephen Sinclair. It's a major breakthrough in the case. But for Jay, just having Nielsen's word isn't enough. He has to find solid proof of the victim's identity. We reached a stage where we were quite worried because the thought was always in our minds that if we charged Nielsen with the murder of John Smith and John Smith turned up at the Old Bailey on the day of the first day of the trial, we would lose credibility all the way through. So we had to be incredibly certain um, of what we had. To give Jay the proof he requires, the forensic team focus their efforts on the body of Nielsen's latest victim. We uh, took from the bags uh, carefully and laid each limb, each bone, out on the floor. So it was perhaps easier than one would have thought to jigsaw everything together. It was a horrendous feeling, really, to, to look at these body parts, especially in the mortuary when they were reassembled, uh, and, and try and think that, you know, these were human beings who were not that long ago walking around reasonably happily. With the body reassembled, Bowen carefully lifts the fingerprints from one of the dismembered hands. By matching them to police records, Jay gets the confirmation he needs. Nielsen's last victim is indeed 20-year-old Stephen Sinclair. Dennis Nielsen is formally charged with murder. Jay can now begin to piece together the final movements of Nielsen's last victim. Tell me about Stephen Sinclair. We went back to my flat and started to drink. He started to nod off. I sat with headphones listening to music. I remember power in many different images. I knew that I must have killed him. The combination of drink and music drives me to tears. tears. How about you? Stephen? sleeping. Following Nielsen's arrest, the police find the strange homemade weapon he'd used to strangle Stephen Sinclair. This was one of the devices that he used to strangle his last victim. Uh, it's a tie with a little piece of string attached to it. Um, he said he murdered nearly all his victims using a tie. Um, in fact, he made a quip at the end so I used to have 15 ties and now all I've got is a clip on one. That was his sense of humour. Next, Jay has to discover how Nielsen disposed of the body. Can't remember anything else until I woke up the next morning. He was still in the armchair. And he was dead. What did you do when you found Sinclair dead in the chair? The following evening, I put a plastic sheet on the middle part of the front room. I took the body and laid it on the plastic sheet and got a long kitchen knife. There's a fair flow of blood. 
some of it overspilled under the carpet. <laughs> I cut the head off and got the pot out of the bathroom. I put the head in the pot, filled it with water. Nielsen details how he'd boil the dismembered body parts to remove the flesh from the bones. Nielsen later goes on to recall how he set about systematically flushing the boiled remains down the toilet. The police continue to build their case against Nielsen. They turn their attention to the task of identifying his other victims. The trail of death and mutilation is about to get a lot longer. The quest to identify Dennis Nielsen's victims is only just beginning. The police have managed to name his last victim as Stephen Sinclair. The two other bodies discovered at Nielsen's North London flat still remain nameless. But Nielsen claims to have killed at least another dozen men. It's 15 or 16, I think. For Peter Jay, identifying the other victims has become a personal mission. One of the things we felt very strongly, because I think 60% of us on the team were parents, we felt very strongly that we should take each investigation to the, the limit because we felt a duty towards parents whose sons may have been victims of Nielsen. So we, we've, we were under considerable pressure. We've, we felt the pressure to to take it as far as we could, so that we can actually be straight up with people at the end and say, your son was a victim or your son wasn't a victim. To discover the fate of the other men killed by Nielsen, the police turn their attention to his previous address in Melrose Avenue. We've been dealing with Cranley Gardens. I understand you told my officers that you previously lived at Wilson Green. Yes. I occupied the rear ground floor flat with exclusive use of the garden. And what will we find there? Unless the site has been completely cleared by contractors, there should be evidence of the remains of at least 12 or 13 people. Who is this man that's so keen to admit the killing of over a dozen men? Born in Fraserborough, Scotland, to a Norwegian father and Scottish mother, Dennis Nielsen had a difficult childhood. Writer Brian Masters spent months interviewing Nielsen. He had no real close contact with his family, except for one member of the family, and that was his grandfather, Andrew. He was a fisherman, and he would disappear at sea for weeks on end. Masters suspects that the death of his beloved grandfather devastated Nielsen's childhood. They took him into uh, the kitchen and on the kitchen table was a long box uh, in which his grandfather was lying. And nobody had explained to him what that meant. And I think his idea of death and his idea of love fused at that moment. Dennis Nielsen left home to join the army just short of his 16th birthday. Serving in the Catering Corps, it was here that Nielsen learnt the butchery skills that he was later to use to dissect the bodies of his victims. After 11 years' service, Nielsen joined the Metropolitan Police. But after only 11 months, he left the force, claiming his increasingly promiscuous homosexual lifestyle was the reason for his departure. Ex-boyfriend Martin Hunter Craig recalls his time with Nielsen with mixed feelings. I found Des very easy to get on with when he hadn't been drinking. Um, he was quite a sensible but unfriendly kind of guy, like a, a bit like an older brother. But 
whenever he he did drink, he would be completely, well, I don't know what the word is, but sometimes obnoxious. He was just downright crude, and I didn't like it at all. Nielsen's last job before his arrest was an executive officer at a job centre in North London. To try and work out how a seemingly respectable civil servant transformed into one of the most prolific serial killers in British history, Peter Jay asks Nielsen about the first time he killed. Nielsen recalls how it all started one New Year's Eve in 1978. After a heavy drinking session, Nielsen returns to his flat with a young man. Nielsen would later tell writer Brian Masters that it was when he woke up that he made the decision that would shape the rest of his life. Nielsen says it was um, amazing the strength that he found he had when the decision had been made. And the decision, he said, was made somewhere inside him. He felt it taking over. Although Nielsen is able to recall how he'd killed his first nameless victim, to Jay's frustration, Nielsen could never say why he killed. We looked at everything you can possibly think of to try and find out why this was happening, because we were frustrated. You always had a motive in a murder, always, but not with this one. After questioning Nielsen for many weeks, Brian Masters believes he's uncovered the reason why Nielsen was driven to kill. Once it had happened, he felt tremendous solace and I think he used the word, which is shocking, benevolence. Because he then treated what was now a corpse as a thing of beauty. He took care of it. He made it feel comfortable in his warped mind. He sat in a chair in front of the television. He'd come home from work and find the body still sitting there and he'd have a chat with it. Guess what happened to me today? So this was a surrogate companion for him. He liked death to be in proximity. He liked the company of corpses. Nielsen admits to hiding his twisted secret from visitors under the floorboards. I believe now that there, were, there, was, there was a couple of people on the floorboards, but um, people have said to me that you've lived with this guy on and off for so long, and yet why didn't you, you know, luck here or luck there? Well, I had. I put my clothes in the wardrobe. There was no bags in the wardrobe. This was at a certain time when obviously people weren't there that this was happening, and once he found a space for them under the floorboards or in the garden or down the sewer or whatever, then he would dispose of the body. Nielsen shares his flat with the body of his first victim for over six months without ever knowing his name. Out of the people. Jay then asks Nielsen about his second victim. This time Nielsen can remember the name. It's a name that's all too familiar to Peter Jay. The second one was Ken Orkenden. A lad by the name of Kenneth Orkenden had gone missing. He was a tourist respectable background, and uh, he just disappeared off the face of the earth. You know, we're just utterly amazed that here suddenly now, five years on, we've got the fellow who murdered Kenneth Ockenden that they spent so much time trying to find. A fingerprint.